Since it's World Communion Sunday today, I thought I would start by a reflection here from our own Marion Elliott, who was for many years on the Communion Guild. And so this is from the book, This Is Us Doing Church. And this is part of Marion's Tales from the Rail reflection. For many years, Dr. Kathleen Harris was the coordinator of the Communion Guild. She was an extremely dedicated and loyal member of the Guild and Metropolitan. To prepare for every communion service, she walked to St. Lawrence Market to buy the ingredients required to bake the bread. Often she would vary the ingredients to make different types of bread. Malcolm told us that once she made one loaf with raisins and cinnamon, and everyone in the congregation was fighting one another to get into that line. Whether you believe that story or not is another question. One Christmas Eve, quite a few years ago, the Guild arrived to set up communion, but Kathleen did not appear. This had never happened before, but in spite of our concern, we had to continue our preparations. After the service, we cleared the silverware and stored it in the safe, wondering all the time what could have happened. Sadly, we learned shortly after that Kathleen had suffered an episode while swimming in her apartment pool and had died. It was a terrible shock for all of us. When her memorial service was held a few days later, her sister from England gave the eulogy while we in the Communion Guild prepared and served communion in her honor. Kathleen's death le left a, a huge hole at Met, particularly in our little working group. She was a brilliant woman, a professor, a writer, and an editor who spoke several languages, and as well, a dedicated baker of communion bread. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you. There is general scholarly consensus on which of the epistles in the New Testament were written by the Apostle Paul and which were not. And the two pastoral letters to Timothy are squarely in the not Paul category. This was common practice in the ancient world. For someone who came after a spiritual leader, such as a follower or family member, to continue the school of thought into the present time by signing the master's name to documents or letters. Far from what we might consider misleading for our ancestors in the faith, this was seen as a way of keeping the teachings alive by having them interact with the issues and context of the current generation. And this is what we see going on here in uh, 2 Timothy. A later disciple is reinterpreting Paul's message to the Pauline churches of Asia Minor in the second or more likely third generation of Christians. Timothy has received the Christian faith through his grandmother Lois, and his mother Eunice. His is a faith that has been passed down from generation to generation. I wonder, I wonder if this sounds familiar to you. Do you have a Lois or a Eunice? Do you have a family member that introduced you to the faith and nurtured you as you grew in your faith life? Maybe a parent or grandparent that would bring you to church or read you Bible stories or act in a Christ-like way that would bring the gospel to life for you. Think about it. Who was Lois? Who was Eunice for you? Hold that thought. We'll come back to it. When we look at the first verses of the epistle to Timothy, we see that a tapestry is being woven here, an intergenerational tapestry of faith that Timothy did not start, but is now his time to pick up the thread and the needle. It is time for him to carry on the traditions and stories and way of life 
and to own his own faith. But when we listen closely, the text reveals some hesitation on his part. Did you hear it? I'm sure this faith lives in you, not Paul says. I write to remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you. Do not be ashamed, the letter goes on to say. Do not be ashamed, for God did not give us the spirit of cowardice, but rather the spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. It sounds like Timothy has pulled away from his faith. He has drifted away from the values and teachings and way of life he has inherited from his mother and grandmother. He is struggling with self-discipline and the temptations of the world. When I read this, I wonder how Lois and Eunice felt to see their beloved child and grandchild go down this path to pull away from them. It is easy to imagine that they were the ones that instigated this letter, letter being written, that they had tried to bring Timothy back but failed and thought that perhaps the pastor could find the right words to rekindle the gift of God that was within him. Have you, I wonder, been in the place of Lois or Eunice? Have you watched your child or grandchild pull away from the faith you have tried to instill in them? Perhaps there have been baptisms or the occasional Christmas or Easter service, but the focus always seems to be elsewhere, on the everyday stresses of family or work or money or on leisure activities or extracurricular commitments. Hockey tournaments always seem to be planned for Sundays, don't they? Or perhaps the children or grandchildren pull away from faith because of the many sins committed in the name of faith. The residential school system, the, resi the uh, rejection of science, the treatment of women, the judgment against LGBTQ people for who they are and who they love. Even as we cry out, that's not what we are about, that's not how faith is supposed to be, we cannot hide from the reality that so many people in our days have either been hurt by church or have negative impressions of church or simply don't see church as something that could ever be for them. You may have been fed and nourished by the great intergenerational family banquet that is the life of faith, and I hope that you have. But in these days, and for a variety of reasons, so many of our beloveds are missing from the table. And that is hard. Alongside the writer of Lamentations, we may look around and grieve. How lonely sits the city that was once so full of people. From this place of seeming scarcity and loss, we may feel like we have done something wrong or that we haven't done enough. If only we had the, the words of Paul, if only we had the leadership of Peter, if only our faith was smart enough or bold enough, if only our faith was big enough, the children and grandchildren would take notice and come back to the table. And then the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith, increase our faith, increase our faith. That's not how this works. Jesus says, if only you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. What Jesus does over and over and over again is move into the places of seeming scarcity and preach abundance. He turns the question of faith away from the issue of quantity with the implication that a certain quotient is necessary for God's will to be done. He turns faith away from a question of quantity to one of sufficiency. You already have what you need, Jesus tells his followers. Even the tiniest amount of faith, even if your faith is full of doubts, and questions, even if it has been batted around in the rough and tumble of your life, even if it has been rubbed raw by the sins of the church, even the smallest amount of faith is enough. 
Because look at what God can do with small things, with seeds, with dreams, with hearts that are open. Faith isn't a competition. It isn't a victory march. It isn't something we can manufacture for ourselves, and it certainly is not something we can create for someone else. Faith is a gift of God, a gift of God that is within you. Faith has power not because we are powerful, but because God is powerful. As the writer of Lamentations goes on to say, the steadfast love of God never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Ours does not need to be a heroic or muscular faith. We do not need to be martyrs or saints for God to make use of us. As Jesus says, the gift of faith simply leads us to do what we ought to do to share and to forgive and to love one another. Faith isn't about being a hero. It isn't about saving souls or saving the church. It isn't about blindly believing this or that. It's about living into your true identity as a beloved child of God within the supportive and affirming family of God. That's it. Faith is claiming your identity as a child of God within the family of God. Do you have a Lois or a Eunice in your life? Did you have a parent or grandparent that introduced you to faith and nourished you in your life of faith? As I've mentioned before, I did not grow up Christian or with faith of any kind. I was not baptized as a child, no Easter or Christmas services, no potluck dinners in the church basement. If I knew anything at all about church, it was of its sins, or of the televangelists promising healing in exchange for cash I would see sometimes while flipping through the TV channels. I didn't have a Lois or a Eunice, and I couldn't imagine that church could ever have something to offer me. I didn't think that I had faith, certainly not enough to make any difference in my life. But then I learned what God can do with even the smallest of things, with seeds, with dreams, with hearts that are open. In a time of personal crisis where I was ripped wide open, Christ called and reached into my life. Christ put me on a very different path with a very different people. When I started going to church, I was far away from my family, who all lived in Western Canada. But I found that I started forming a new family, a chosen family. And when our children were born, even though their grandparents all lived far away, through the church, they had dozens of grandparents kind and thoughtful people that genuinely cared about them and their well-being. My life and the life of my family is so much better and richer for being part of the family of God. Looking around at his friends and disciples, Jesus once said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. The nature of religion is changing, even before our eyes. The family compacts where family members sit in the same pew generation after generation are becoming rare and rare. We live in a more mobile and pluralistic world. There are more options for spiritual expression. There are more pressures on our time. The days of church just being something everyone does on Sunday is over. And yet faith is still very present because God's faithfulness is still very present. The Spirit is still on the move. Christ is still reaching into people's lives. I know this to be true because it has happened to me. I found my way here through those doors 
to this people of God, as have you. And together we are building a home, a home for hope and for healing in this beautiful and broken world. Even in this time where baptisms and confirmations are down and the community is split between in-person and online, something important is happening each week. New people are coming through those doors, and in many cases, they are brand new to faith or have been hurt by another expression of faith. But they have felt Christ's call, Christ's pull in their lives, and they have taken the courageous first step of walking through those doors. God's faithfulness endures. In our response to God's faithfulness, even if our own faith feels small and battered, is to simply do what is expected of us as children of God, to share, to forgive, to love, to be a family of God for all who come with their hearts wide open. This is World Communion Sunday, a day when millions of Christians all around the world will take the sacred elements of bread and cup. We often think of communion as something we receive, the symbols of the body and blood of Christ that point to his ongoing presence in the world. We receive communion, certainly, but it is also something we give. We give communion by feeding others as we have been fed, serving others as we have been served. We cannot give someone else faith. All we can do is have faith that God is working through even the smallest of things, And when someone's heart is opened, and when they encounter Christ's call, all we need to do is have the table prepared. Have the table prepared and say with gladsome hearts, we are so glad you are here. We've been waiting for you. Welcome to the family. As Marion said in her Tales from the Rail reflection, the death of Kathleen Harris left a hole in the life of this community and in the communion guild, the group of volunteers that prepare the communion meal on Sundays such as this. But her witness also stands as an inspiration to others that follow in her footsteps, even as some members of the communion guild have now retired and still others have passed away in recent years. And we are so thankful to their service, for them for their service. We also celebrate because this morning a new team has lovingly prepared the elements for us. The intergenerational feast of faith continues. It continues. Look around you. Look around you. Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Communion is a sacred meal, a meal so sacred sacred that in this church we fall to our knees to receive it. But it is also a family meal, a meal that we receive and give as a family of Christ, bound together not by blood, but by choice and by spirit. Faith is something we do, and it is something we do together. This is God's gift to each of us. This is God's gift. Thanks be to God. Amen.